Welcome to Nourish with Kristen, your weekly chat with certified nutrition therapist and lifelong foodie, Kristen Whitaker, coming to you from Utah Natural Wellness with a reminder that your food should serve you. So let's dish. Okay, welcome to Utah Natural Wellness. With Kristen Whitaker, your certified nutrition therapist, excited to talk about everything food. Um, glad you could join us. Whether you're here on the Facebook Live or you're joining us later, it's good to have you. You can always shoot me your questions and comments here with us live or in our Facebook group later, or you know, email me any ideas you have for future chats. I'm open to whatever's on your mind. Okay, today uh, we are talking about picky eating, which you know. I know all the moms in my circle just go, oh no, strikes fear in your heart, right? How many of us have had battles? Um, before we start, let me go, I'm not specifically going to be talking about toddlers. Um, and even though that's commonly where most of the picky eating comes from, but what some of us don't talk about is adults like us. We're grownups, right? And we, we're trusted to feed ourselves, but how many of us are secret picky eaters or admitted we only like certain foods certain ways and we won't try other things or uh, we feel like failures for for whatever reason. Okay, um, if you have tips and tricks that you use to battle picky eating with yourself or with your family, go ahead and share them with me. I've had a few come in that were pretty entertaining and uh, we're just gonna jump in. So first of all picky eating can spawn a lot of emotions whether from you as the caregiver the one cooking for the the picky eater or for the person themselves and i know i'm a mom of four kids and i thought i dodged a bullet because i had three kids who would eat pretty much anything and when i say anything i mean it we've had uh jellyfish night at our house we've had octopus we've had uh rabbit we've had every vegetable you can think of and usually it goes off without a hitch and I was always really proud of that. I thought perhaps I was this stellar, amazing mother. Then child number four came along to remind me that it had nothing to do with my parenting. It has a lot to do <laughs> with personalities and just how they come. Number four daughter, uh, child, was uh, something altogether different. Might be why she's the last. Just kidding, Zeta. I love you. Zeta wouldn't eat anything at all. I don't... There were times I said to my my husband, I don't know how she's alive. I don't know what's actually getting down her and every night was a battle. So I have sympathy for picky eaters. Also, um, some of you might know from my, it was just my birthday and I posted about this, but I have a twin sister and we grew up in the same house with the same parents in the same environment and I would eat everything. In fact, I made it my mission to eat everything. I loved food in mass quantities and I ate everything and she was the pickiest eater. It, she wouldn't eat it unless it was the shape that she wanted, the brand that she wanted, the size that she wanted. It wasn't touching anything else. It had to fit her criteria. And honestly, it was ridiculous. Love you too, Karen. Uh, I spent a lot of time eating her food under the table or on the sly for her so that she wouldn't be at the dinner. T She'd still be at the dinner table. Mom would say, you can't leave till you clean your plate. She'd still be there today if it wasn't for me. So um, though not personally a picky eater, I have experience with picky eaters and I think all of us have so okay so before we begin with this issue it's important that we establish an attitude or an environment of respect uh, and this is hard especially when you're cooking and you're the mom and you've got a million kids it feels like and you're trying to get it on the table and you're busy and one kid just refuses to take a bite right it's hard to foster respect and love, especially in the moment when you're just tired and exhausted and, and you think you should have applause, adorations, and accolades not be met with resentment. I, I get that. But really, this is a lifelong pursuit to develop a, a positive relationship with food. We're not just putting food in front of our kids or in front of ourselves. We are teaching them to nourish their bodies. We're teaching them to appreciate food. We're teaching them that food builds them. So if we turn this into a power struggle and we shame and we belittle and we, we call names or we threaten or we punish, 
there that's going to get wrapped up into food issues that they will have their entire life right we want we want to start off on the right foot i know this is easier said than done but let's look to have respect let's look to listen uh especially when they're little that's hard because you just hear no or maybe they're throwing food or just they clam up and they won't do anything but let's try to hear them when they say they don't like something maybe maybe there is a reason and sometimes there just isn't but anyway let's try to be respectful and then in all of our approaches no even these tips i'm going to share it might not work because we're all different so we really have to have a heart and a mind that's willing to customize and individualize each situation so for for example with my other three kids they were pretty pretty good eaters so it was okay if i put a new food and they didn't want to eat it for me to say all right you have to try two bites before you can pass you can't tell me you don't like it until you've tried it two times and that was enough to get them past it. ew mom no really most of the time they would try it and most of the time they would like it and keep going and so that was pretty easy but then along came zeta oh along came zeta and it was like nothing i've ever seen i couldn't force feed her i'm a shame to say I tried. I couldn't bribe her with toys. I couldn't threaten her with grounding. I couldn't, there was nothing I could do that would make this girl eat. If I did get something in, she would gag and she would throw it up and she would cry and there'd be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth from all of us by the time this was done. And I realized that rule didn't work for her. There was no forcing her. So I had to negotiate. Um, so our simple rule worked for the other kids with her. I actually had a deal. If she would have a smoothie for breakfast, a green smoothie, and she'd let me make her a smoothie and I would pack in all kinds of nutritious things, greens and berries and protein and uh, probiotics, all these things into a smoothie. If she would drink that for breakfast, I would give her a get out of dinner free card, which meant if she just really wouldn't eat or try what I made for dinner, she was welcome to go get herself a piece of, uh, toast with peanut butter was probably a big one or make a sandwich or have some pasta or something else that she would eat so that's that's how i got around the mighty titan zeta uh, it was negotiating and it was bargaining either way she was such a strong personality she had to have a voice and a say in what she ate but me being her mom had to have a voice and a say in her nutrition and that's how we reached a compromise so that's just an example of how it's completely different dealing with one kid to another and not just kids remember we're talking about adults too so um so we're, we're working on having respect and listening. We're flexible, know that it's not one size fits all and what works for one kid might not work for other kids and, and be open because it's just, when it comes down to it, this parenting thing is an adventure. When we put food on the table, it's never a simple thing and we need to be flexible and ready to change. Okay, some of the tricks in, that you might've heard before, have you heard the, um, I have mixed reviews on them. So like hiding vegetables in, in your food uh, that works. I, I've been guilty of putting carrots in the tomato sauce or blending cauliflower into the chili. Seriously done that. However, I would I would caution if you're going to do that to be upfront about it and not try to slide something past them and then, ha, ah, guess what? I got you to eat a vegetable. Because when we are, we really do need to have trust and communication. We're providing and they need to trust us that we're not trying to trick them. And so I have used that and maybe you do need to on occasion, but in general these tips and tricks people have if they're built on dishonesty, I I don't think they should be our go-to. I think we can find better ways. And um, a lot of that is by getting them on board this journey. So in the end, we're going to have a lot better experience if they're on board with us instead of fighting us. So let's start with um, education. So now keep in mind, I'm in, a te I'm in a teenage phase. And so it's a lot easier for me now to get my kids on board than it was when we were little. So when I say education, it can look like so many different things. But in general, and I'm this way too, if I understand why I'm doing something, I'm much more likely to do it. So uh, with my kids, I've actually, we've watched food documentaries together on a Sunday afternoon. We've, um, I've highlighted ingredients and said, oh, we're going to try to eat this today because this is good for us because of this. And we've learned about things like that. We've learned about different cultures and then sampled their foods. It's part of a learning experience. And that's done a lot to get them to try new things. With uh, with little kids, you can, <laughs> like they're going to sit down and watch watch a documentary with you or or a newsreel or anything like that. But you know what you can do is you can model good good eating behavior. You can eat the vegetables on your plate. What an idea, right? 
And you can say things like, oh, I just feel better when I eat a salad. I feel so much better the rest of the day. Or you can say, here, honey, if you try this, it will make your tummy feel better. Uh, and if you're open in my house, you might even say, here, try a bite of this. It will help you poop. Kids, they love, they love that. It's the only potty talk we allow at the table. Uh, but, but watch what you're modeling. Look at the words. If there's a food you don't like, try serving that at the table and, and you can model the way to deal with that. I've done that before. I absolutely hate applesauce. I hate it. I can make it. I can make a really good gourmet cinnamon chunky applesauce from scratch. I hate it. It tastes like apples. Someone took a bite, chewed it up, spit it on my plate and told me to eat it. And it's been that way since I was little. And my mom made me she called them no thank you helpings and I had to eat them every meal. Okay, I tried it, no thank you, I still hate it. And I just know I hate applesauce, but I have purposely put it on my plate before and my kids know I hate it. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna give this another try just to see. So they can see me doing something I've asked them to do. And then I usually say, mm, still not my favorite thing. All right, see, these are ways that we can educate. The next uh, point I wanna make is exploration. So um, our kids, they don't like to be labeled or, or name called in any way, right? But when you call them a picky eater, you've just pigeonholed them into a rut. And for the rest of their life, I have friends that still say, oh yeah, I'm a picky eater. I always have been. They've been labeled that at some point and there's just no escaping that. So maybe let's ditch the labels and say instead, hey, you are such a great explorer. I love how you try new things. That's pretty cool that you do that. Um, or I know this isn't your favorite, but you did it anyway. That's amazing if we try the positive talk. And with that, we can use it to foster um, exploration. When it comes to food, this is the best method um, across the board. So let me start with a little story. Again, with Zeta, my picky eater, who I thought there was just no hope for. I thought she was going to die of rickets or scurvy or something from being malnourished. Uh, and... I was focusing kind of on the older kids. I must say I actually kind of gave up and catered to her for a while because the fight was not worth it. And we were on a healthy challenge and I was trying to learn some new dishes. So I took out all my cookbooks and I, I'm a little obsessive with cookbooks, so see. I've got like three shelves over here you can't see just of cookbooks. I pulled them out and I said, hey guys, each one of you pick out a recipe. Just flip through all these books and pick out a recipe that appeals to you and I'm gonna make it for you and you're gonna help me and we're gonna try some new things. And to my kids who were six and under, this was really exciting. They got on board, they poured through those, they showed me pictures, they said, mom, I want this one. And I committed to cook this dish with them and buy all the ingredients on the day that they picked, I took them to the store to get, I turned it into a real experience and it actually paid dividends. This crazy scheme worked. We tried so many new foods we hadn't tried before, but Zeta was probably only two and a half, maybe three. And I thought for sure this was beyond her, but she grabbed a book and went in a corner and flipped and she pointed to one and she picked, I think it was beef and broccoli. Um, I thought there's no, I said, oh honey, you won't like that. And she's like, no, no mom, this, this. And I'm like, okay. So I made it and it turns out broccoli that she'd never had before. I would never have dared try that on her was her favorite thing. She loved it. She gobbled it all up all because she picked that meal. I never would have known that she liked broccoli. On another occasion we did this and she actually picked, it was an, it was an ad for like a cafe Rio salad out of a magazine. And I'm like, you want me to make that? Nope. She wanted to eat the cilantro on top of the salad. I wouldn't have known if I didn't have pictures for her to flip through. And I found out my kid who wouldn't eat jelly on a sandwich, she wouldn't try it because it looked gross. What well, kid won't eat jelly? She wouldn't eat that, but she loves broccoli and she loves cilantro. Nuts. So giving options like that and avenues to explore new foods, that is a great way to get them to try new, new things. Um, like I mentioned before, we've done around the world journeys where we'll pick a country or a culture and say, hey, let's, let's try that. We can't travel there. I wish I could take you to France. I wish we could go visit the rainforest, but let's try a food from there. And we would order something exotic or maybe just find a recipe to fix. And that's another way we've tried lots of foods, different spices and found out things that we really like. Um, and then when it comes right down to it, there's the make friends method I call of exploration. And this works for adults better than kids, but I've got kids to do this too. You pick something that you just don't like and then you figure it out. You approach it like a challenge. I'm gonna make friends with this vegetable. For me, one of them was asparagus. 
The only time I'd ever had asparagus was in high school. My uh, human biology teacher got the canned asparagus that looks like a stringy yellow pile of, you know what it looks like, it's disgusting. And he put it in Dixie cups and after he heated it on a Bunsen burner and he made us eat that. And um, for an experiment, we had to report on what our urine smelled like the next day, which is really fun to do in front of your high school class, right? But uh, I told him I wasn't going to eat it. I'm like, that's disgusting. I'm not going to do it. He said, you'll flunk the whole semester if you don't. So I did it. It was so gross. I gagged. I got it down. And I swore off asparagus. I would never eat asparagus. So then, here I am as an adult trying to learn to be healthy. And I find out asparagus is really good for you. And I'm like, okay, I got to figure this out. Turns out, I don't like boiled asparagus. I don't like canned asparagus. But I love roasted asparagus. If you roast it till the edges are crispy, drizzle it with some av avocado oil, and then put a little Parmesan on it, oh my gosh, I could eat that forever. So what happened was I got ruined and thought I hated a whole food group, right? All asparagus, anything with asparagus in it, that's disgusting. Uh, I just needed to figure out how I liked it. And I could tell you that so many other vegetables I used to never eat, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. I was violently opposed to Brussels sprouts, and now I love them. Um, uh, lamb was one I didn't like and now I do. Uh, fish, all kinds of different things. This will work if you just go with an open mindset and say, I'm going to figure this out. If I don't like it this way, I'm going to like it this way. So give it another chance. Okay. Um, I think the reason this exploration method really works is because we allow ourselves or the kids the choice to try different things. And again, that comes back to the respect. If we have a little bit of control and a little bit of agency, we're more likely to be on board, right? So a lot of your meals when you're cooking with picky eaters uh, can be used to cater to that. Now, I'm not a fan of short order cooking where you make everything to everyone's liking, but I have learned to put something on the table that people customize themselves. So maybe you have a taco bar or fajita night or a pasta bar, or you have a salad bar, which kids can even learn to love a salad bar, or you have a burger night, but you have all these different toppings on it. And then the kids get to pick what they want on that. And we do that all the time. And I'll see if Zeta's got her hamburger with um, nothing on it. And I'll say, hey, why don't you try a slice of tomato today? And maybe she will, because it's in the offerings and I gave her the choice. Oh, we'll do still on this burger night where uh, two of my daughters will have it on a bun and the rest of us will have it wrapped in lettuce. And we all have the toppings we can pick from. And it's a good way to cater and take the battle out of dinner. Because I really, I hate it when the contention comes to the dinner table. That's where we're supposed to be enjoying ourselves and our family time and our food. So if you can find meals with options to customize, that will help you get around that picky eater. And then they'll be in the mood to perhaps try something new. And maybe it'll be their idea to put this on their um, haystack or whatever you're eating. So just... Things like that on occasion can help facilitate success. Another thing that can help with our choice is the way that we dress it. And you guys with kids, you all know this. If they can dip it in ketchup or they can dip it in ranch dressing, they're probably more likely to get it. That works for adults too. I can only go so far on salad, but if I have, like I have this favorite probiotic honey mustard dressing I like, I'll drizzle that all over and I can eat a bowl the size of my face and be happy about it, okay? Or, you know, I'll, the crudite at the, the, the party table that nobody's eating, if there's a good dip, that's going down, I'll do it. Um, the trick is to make sure you have healthy offerings. So maybe you don't want the bottled Hidden Valley Ranch stuff full of, you know, crappy oils and preservatives, but you made your own fresh ranch and you have that available for the kids. So, um things that you can dip or dress it, topping things with cheese or sour cream or whatever your toppings are, or even a fondue style. A fondue night is a great way to get your kids to try different vegetables. We've done that where like everyone's on board with this, this bubbly cheese pot. Let's dip different things and see what that tastes like. That's a great way to do a tasting. So dressing it up and, um, and then again, uh, back to my applesauce story. Sometimes We'll try things and we'll try things and we'll try things and we don't like them. Now, keep trying because it can take between 12 and 20 times, the experts say, to actually like a food. Um, some of us take longer to get used to a new flavor, a new texture, a new idea, and it takes us a while for our brain to kick in, kick in and say, yeah, I like this. So keep trying. But really, there's some foods, no matter what you do, you're just not going to like. I am never going to like applesauce. I'm never going to like cornbread. I'm sorry. I've tried. Um... I, I can eat it now, 
but in the long run I've decided I can live without it, right? There's no nutritional hole in my diet that's holding me back because I'm not eating these foods. So I've accepted that and I don't force it unless um, society calls for it. Like it would be rude not to, so I will, I can do that. But um, it's okay to accept defeat. Which brings me for an, an example. One of the comments I got in here was from Laura. Hi Laura, if you're listening ever. Uh, she said, I hate avocados and I hate cauliflower. What can you do about that? Well, there's a few things. You can substitute those. So just leave them off your plate and eat something else. I used to hate cauliflower because it looked like ghosted broccoli, like somebody had sucked the soul out of broccoli and sold it to me as food. And that was enough of a block for me not to give it a chance. So eat broccoli instead of cauliflower. Or if you just don't like avocados, eat put hummus on your toast or um, use smashed peas to make a, a guacamole-like dip. It's actually really good. There's different things you can do. Or you, if you decide, I really want to get these, you know, um, they're both nutritional powerhouses. I want them in my diet. Well, both of them are really versatile. Have you tried all these different ways to make it? Like cauliflower, have you tried it roasted? Have you tried rice cauliflower, ham fried cauliflower, cauliflower tabbouleh, cauliflower pizza? You've heard that saying, if cauliflower can be pizza, you can be anything, right? There's so many things and ways to do cauliflower. So give it another try. Keep trying different ways, but if it comes down to you don't like it, that's okay. And avocado, you can make... Uh, you can hide it in a smoothie if you need to sneak it past yourself and you really want it, you, you know it's high in healthy fats, it's high in fiber, it's high in potassium, it's got all these things you want, hide it in a smoothie and get it past yourself until you develop a flavor for it. If you um, need new ways to cook it, try cutting it in cubes and marinating it in lemon juice and serving it with papaya chunks for like a salad. Really good, tastes completely different. Just think outside of the box, different ways to try it you haven't tried before. And if it comes down to you just don't like avocado, no shame, more for me, I love avocados. So uh, yeah, um, there's one more method I wanna tr talk to about how to get picky eaters to eat more food, including yourself. And, and it might be one you haven't thought about before. And this is to do a, a dietary reboot. So unfortunately in our modern diet, we have been um, conditioned to like extreme flavors. Um, you know, extreme nacho cheese, extreme pizza flavor, all these amped up chemical flavors and everything's got sugar and lots of salt and lots of preservatives and additives and things designed to just light us up and make us want more, right? Um, and it's fostered food addictions. But another thing it's, it's fostered is like flavor dysmorphia if that's even a word, whatever I just said, uh, we can't even taste real food anymore or appreciate the subtleties of it because we're always looking for this next amped up fix. So how do you fix that? You're gonna have to go without for a little while or go for a, a cleanse um, to reboot your taste. So for example, have any of you ever done a 10 day sugar fast, which is really hard. It means you cut out sugar in all forms. So sugar, honey, sweeteners, uh, hidden and obvious added sugars, you, you cut it all out for 10 days. When you go back on sugar, something that you used to eat every day, you'll take a sip of or a bite of it and you'll be like, whoa, whoa, that's too sweet because you're recalibrating your taste. So that's something good to do every once in a while, just to take everything fake out and give yourself a reboot. An example was my son, Damon, who had to go on a restricted therapeutic diet for, for medical reasons. And it had been a couple months and one day I was making a cake with his little sisters and we were frosting it and he just, oh, his the look on his face was so pained. This was his favorite, this was our birthday cake, this was the best life got was this cake, right? And I could see him and I, and I felt really bad. I said, honey, why don't you just swipe a finger full of frosting, just give it a try. Really, mom, I can? Well, sure, if you want to. So he did, he dipped his finger and then he immediately spit it out. The look on his face went from <gasps> to, uh, to, and he spit it out. And I said, what's wrong? Knowing what was wrong, he goes, it doesn't taste like I remember. Yeah, his taste had rebooted. And even now he would rather have a big bowl of fruit or some real, real food than that fake frosting stuff that we were using. So give your, give your taste buds a chance to reboot. Suddenly you'll appreciate subtle things. Um, another part of this picture, this rebooting, is our gut biome. A lot of people don't think that your guts affect your your taste, but it does, and I'll tell you how. So our microbiome, we're all aware that we have 
billions of these um, microflora and beneficial bacteria and yeasts and things growing in our system and we need them. They help us digest our food, absorb our nutrients, they help our immune system, they even affect our brain. They're essential to our survival. However, the strains that we have inside of us depend on what we feed them. Okay, so if we're eating a diet high in sugar and processed foods, the flora that will bloom in our gut are the flora that prefer these kinds of foods. Okay, and that's when we get a strong craving and a propensity for these foods because we have cultured the life, the microbiome inside of us to crave those foods. That's what they, they flourish and live on, right? So if we make a sudden dietary change, like you haven't eaten a salad in years and you're gonna suddenly go vegetarian, your body is gonna revolt. This microbiome, this gut garden that you've grown and fostered is gonna go, what? No, give me my burgers, give me my fries, give me my Cheetos, give me my Diet Coke. And, and those cravings are real and they're strong, okay? However, if we slowly adjust to a more whole food lifestyle and we're starting to eat more vegetables and more fibrous foods and we're starting to eat clean, healthy foods, then, then the balance will shift in our microbiome. And suddenly we're fostering bacteria that crave these things, that thrive on things. And what's good to know is the bacteria that thrive on healthy food have healthy benefits to our, to our overall vitality. So this is a good change, but you will find yourself craving nutrient-dense food. Suddenly you won't want those Cheetos that will almost look repulsive to you. You're going to want the um, that salad that's just full, bursting with vegetables and grass-fed steak strips on top and a probiotic dressing. That's gonna look good to you. It'll be night and day different. People don't believe me, but I'm living proof of that. Uh, another story about another kid is my daughter Taylor, who grew up with a sweet tooth like her mom. She could find sugar, I swear she had a radar for it. She loved chicken nuggets, she loved pizza, she loved ice cream, she was just your typical American kid. And then she got really sick and we had to make some huge changes in her diet. And uh, I remember having a face off with her at dinner one time where I'd made this chicken bacon ranch casserole. And I was so proud of this because I'm like, these are all your favorite things in one dish, you're gonna love this, I'm such a good mom. I put it down and she wouldn't eat it. Like we had, we had it out, we had the power struggle you're not supposed to have. I was not in the space to be respectful. I was upset, she was sassy. It, it was not a pretty thing. And I, this is horrible, but I actually said, well, lean down and smell it. And she did, and I tipped her head into her food. I totally did the <clears throat> And she looked up with food all over her face and her eyes were this big. And my husband looked at me like, you have lost it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, world's worst mother, I'm so sorry. And then she licked her mouth and she went, that's really good. She loved it. And she ended up eating a lot. Anyway, this was the kid that I'm working with. The one that wouldn't always try foods and sometimes gave me, gave me crap about it. And she just loved junk food. She seriously did. So when we switched her to this whole food diet, uh, you can imagine there was a lot of problems, but her health, her health was on the line. Like we had to do this. And, um, uh, we, I used the education to get her on board. Um, and we used, the explore method she went through cookbooks and we found things that she would like that she could have and we we did that and um i tried to listen and be compassionate as we switched her over this but fast forward to several years later now she's eating this way and i asked her what her favorite foods are so she went her favorite foods when she was 12 would have been pizza fried chicken uh, chicken nuggets um ice cream chips cheetos doritos all these things that those would have been her favorite foods I asked her now, and she, I'm not kidding, she said, ooh, mom, I love garlic chicken hearts, kabucha, dark chocolate, 85% or higher. I love it when you make poke bowls, which is a raw salmon salad that I make. Um, she went on and on with these foods that I never in a million years would have guessed she'd ever try, let alone love, and these are the foods that she craves. And in her life now, a uh, bowl of sliced fruit is more exciting to her than a bowl of ice cream. She's turned down ice cream, even ice cream that was made out of ingredients she could have in favor of these frozen blueberries that she just loves. So things change and it just takes a little patience and open-mindedness and time and you'll find that uh, your body will adapt and you'll begin to love the food that you give it. So um, as, as adults, you know, we have a little more control over what we put in our body and that's for good or bad because some of us are a slave to our habits. We go fast, cheap and easy, right? And that's all we eat. But if we'd be a little bit more mindful, we'll tell ourselves these are the foods that I like. But if we'd be mindful to cultivate 
a, a palate and a gut that appreciates the finer foods will we'll make this shift and suddenly we have this burst of energy and appreciation for real natural things and that's such a fun place to live. Uh, so a plug for that, for rebooting. Rebooting can be done by yourself, um, but if, if you need a little help with that, uh, like a system or a method to help you reboot your taste bud and your gut, let me know. Okay, so to review some of these for these hi that just popped on here today, we've talked about customizing, having an attitude of respect and love, and then using education, exploration, and free will to uh, make us to help us overcome picky eating, um, and then even acceptance. As I wrap it up here really quick, I did want to talk about the difference between picky eating and underlying issues that might require professionals. One of them would be allergies and intolerances. So uh, if you, you might consider, if you have, if you consider yourself a picky eater, you might think about getting allergy tested because maybe some of these foods that you have aversions to, there's a real biological reason to it. Um, I know I tested and what was it that I, I can't remember right now. There was a, oh, dates. I, I don't really like a lot of dates. I've never really, you know, I've tried the Lara bars and stuff and my kids love them. I make it for them, but I never really liked them and couldn't explain why. I was really high in intolerance levels for dates when I tested, did a food panel. That's something I can help you order. Um, come see me in the store and I'll hook you up. So that's an easy fix because you'll get that list and you'll know, oh, okay, I know to take this off and some things might come back. You might be able to fix that and be able to enjoy them later. Uh, on a further note, I wanna talk about, just briefly, selective eating disorder. And this is extreme picky eating. I think the, the official name for it in the DSM catalog is avoidant restrictive food, take, food intake disorder. Um, but this is beyond picky eating. Like a picky eater is defined as someone who will eat maybe 30 foods or more. And extreme picky is they will eat less than 20 foods, fewer than 20 foods. Um, and a picky eater won't like food and will resist new foods. Uh, selective eating disorder, someone there has real fear and real anxiety about new foods. Rather than avoiding foods they don't like, there might be whole food groups that they're wiping out. And also they might have other issues accompanying that, like um, like irritable bowel or OCD or anxiety and depression, different things like that, in addition to this picky eating that would clue you in that there's more going on than just the food. Um, uh, extreme picky eaters will have sensory issues, so it's like, you know, all of us don't like have texture issues from time to time, but they just can't stand their food to touch or certain textures or certain smells will just completely shut them down. Um, and then where picky eating is kind of a normal developmental stage and we, we outgrow it and we go through cycles, this extreme picky eating doesn't. It can persist even into adulthood. It can change their life. It can make them avoid social eating situations and you know, you can't, you can't power them out of this. Like a picky eater might go to bed hungry and, and catch up the next day or they might skip a meal here or there, but a selective eating disorder that person will starve rather than eat a food that they just can't handle. So if you see any of those signs, that goes beyond, hey, let's see if we can hide some vegetables in their spaghetti sauce. That's, uh, that, that can go into food disorders and you need to find a professional help for that. So a plug for that and just to be aware. I did, uh, to help you out, if you're dealing with picky eaters in your family, a couple of Facebook groups that I recommend. One is called Feeding Littles and they, they're a great resource lots of moms on there sharing and um, another one is another Facebook group is called Extreme Eating Help. Um, they actually have a book on Amazon. It's only like eight dollars. It's called Helping Your Child with Extreme Picky Eating, a step-by-step -step guide. And, and if you're beyond the little kids like me, you've got teenagers or even for yourself, they just came out with a workbook called Conquer Picky Eating for Teens and Adults. I think it's it's more like $18, but that might be worth looking at you, looking at for your family. So anyway, there's some resources to help you. And then as always, I'm here to help you if you need to talk about it. You can always come into the store, Utah Natural Meat in West Jordan. We're open today. So Tuesdays and Thursdays from two to six, Saturdays 10 to three. So come on in for a chat. Tell me what your picky eating woes and struggles are. Uh, you can also book an appointment with me if you need some one-on-one -on -one attention or some help 
with a strategy to get you and your family expanding their palate. So my website is nourishwithkristin.com. You can get a, a complimentary 20 minute session just, just by going on that site right now and booking a phone call. There's a real advantage to looking at picky eating in ourselves and our kids and trying to learn healthy eating habits. We only have our kids for so long and then they're out of the house and they have to feed themselves. Gasp. I don't want my kids to go to college like I did and live on ramen noodles. <laughs> I blame that for so many of the issues I still have today. I want them to be able to navigate a world and, and feed them in a way that will truly nourish them help them think and feel better, be free of, you know, anxiety and depression and and body image issues and fatigue and all these things that we battle every day. I don't want them to live on the diet cycle. I don't want them to live with shame or to avoid situations. I want them to have confidence in eating. Eating good, diverse food is part of that. So it's worth it to analyze your own pickiness and to take the efforts and the time to involve your family in, in making healthy food choices. So if I can just plug that, that would really get the ball rolling in so many other courts, in other food related um, health issues that you're having. So anyway, yeah, give me a call if I can help you out. And in the comments, feel free to tell me what foods you just can't stand. And as for me, it's applesauce and cornbread. Just can't do it. <laughs> okay, bye.